أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم When I was about 14 or 15 years old, I remember my parents had bought me a Super Nintendo. This is like way back in the day now. And one of the games they had bought me was this game called Magic Sword. Now this game Magic Sword was a very, very frustrating game. It had something like 110 levels. And I remember I got to the 110th level and when I thought I had beat the boss and I had finished the game, it said you need to go back to level 70 something because you're missing a key and you won't, can't finish the game without it. And I thought to myself, fun, I put in all this hard work playing this game only to get to the end to be told that playing this game was absolutely futile and useless. Now why do I start off with this example? It's such a simple example, but you can see the frustration. An individual that played that long to get nothing out of it at the end. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he tells us in the Quran, وَقَدِّمْنَا إِلَىٰ مَا عَمِلُوا مِنْ عَمَلٍ فَجَعَلْنَاهُ حَبَاءً مَنْثُورًا That there will be a group of people that they're going to show up on the Day of Judgment, thinking that they have a plethora, a myriad of good deeds. Meaning they've done every good deed that they can possibly think of. But they'll have one shortcoming. And that one shortcoming will be enough to render all of their deeds null and void. In fact, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in this verse, it is going to turn their mountains of good deeds into scattered dust. What is that deed? They committed shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They committed shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is what the crux of tonight's talk is about, bi'idhnillahi ta'ala. That one sin that is completely unforgivable. That if an individual was to die upon it, his fate is the hellfire. And there is no other destination for him other than that. So let us firstly start off by talking about some of the dangers of shirk. Some of the dangers of shirk. The first one, as we mentioned already, that it is the only sin that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not forgive. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Nisa, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَغْفِرُ أَنْ يُشْرَقَ بِهِ وَيَغْفِرُ مَا دُونَ ذَلِكَ لِمَنْ يَشَاءَ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not forgive that anyone should commit shirk with him, but he forgives everything other than that to whom he pleases. So the point, of, uh, the point we want to derive from this verse is that if you understand the nature of sin, that there are two types of sin, a major sin and a minor sin. For major sins, they require a specific repentance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then even then, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will still forgive individuals as He pleases in the hereafter. Then the second type of sin are those minor sins. It is good for these minor sins that if we seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but if an individual was ignorant or he forgot, then the good deeds that he does, they actually wipe out these minor sins away. And here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking and saying and telling us that out of all of the sins that an individual can commit, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive all of them if he were to die upon them. Even if he dies with them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive them, bi'idhnillahi ta'ala, except for one of those crimes. And that is the crime of associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that is the first danger. And I want you guys to enumerate these with me, count these with me, bi'idhnillahi ta'ala, so they, retain, they stay in your head. The second danger of shirk is that this is the only crime that will cause an individual to stay in the hellfire forever. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّهُ مَنْ يُشْرِكْ بِاللَّهِ فَقَدْ حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ الْجَنَّةِ وَمَأْوَاهُ النَّارِ That the individual that performs shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then he has prohibited for him the hellfire and his final destination, he has prohibited for him paradise and his final destination is the hellfire. So all of these blessings that we hear about paradise in terms of, you know, having that drink that you will never feel thirsty of after again, these mansions made out of gold, being in the company of the Prophet sallallahu seeing the beautiful face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The individual that dies upon shirk, he's prohibited from all of these things. And in fact, he's in the exact opposite, that he ends up being in the hellfire in the worst of companies, in the worst, of the, in the company of Fir'aun, in the company of Iblis, in the company of Haman, and all of the other uh, evil creations that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created. Then the third and last danger I'll mention of shirk is that it nullifies one's good deeds. So all the good deeds that a person does, they are no longer worth anything. And in fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He conveys this in a very, very serious tone. So if you were to look inside Surah Al-Zumar, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, so the one being addressed is the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam directly. And He says, وَلَقَدْ أُوْحِيَ إِلَيْكَ وَإِلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكَ 
لَإِنْ أَشْرَقْتَ لَيَحْبَطَنَّ عَمَلُكْ وَلَا تَكُنَّنَّ مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ that, O oh Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it has been revealed to you just like it was revealed to those prophets and messengers before you. That if you were to commit shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then it would render all of your deeds null and void. Now, the lessons we derive from this verse alone. Number one, it was not possible for the messenger of Allah or any of the prophets to commit shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yet, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala still addresses these prophets and messengers and tells us that if they even had committed shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with their high rank, with their high status, with their plethora and myriad of good deeds, then even they would have their deeds rendered null and void. And then the second consequence that is related to having your deeds rendered null and void, that it becomes impermissible for the believers to seek forgiveness for you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he tells us in Surah At-Tawbah, مَا كَانَ لِلنَّبِيِّ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَنْ يَسْتَغْفِرُوا لِلْمُشْرِكِينَ That it is not befitting for the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or the believers that they seek forgiveness for those people that die in a state of shirk. So right now I've mentioned four dangers of shirk. Who can repeat them to me? So let's start off with one. Who remembers one danger of shirk? Who can remember one danger of shirk? I've mentioned four of them. Go ahead. So a person will be in the hellfire forever. Excellent. Your good deeds will be rendered null and void. Excellent. You have your hand. It nullifies your good deeds. It nullifies your good deeds. Excellent. And we have one more. What is the last one? The very first one I mentioned. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not forgive shirk. That he forgives all other sins if an individual is to die upon it except for shirk. So now you know the dangers of shirk. You know that's a very important subject to study. So what exactly is shirk? When we talk about shirk, what exactly are we talking about? You want to answer that question? Mashallah, I wish I had candy or chocolate to give you. Associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's very good. But in specific things, so the specific definition we want to derive for talking about shirk is to give a right which is exclusive to Allah to other than Allah. And this definition is very important to understand because this will be the basis for our further discussion. It is to give a right which is specific to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in summary, the one right which is exclusive to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it is to direct our worship, the most exclusive of rights, to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now how do we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? You'll notice that we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in three facets. There's three different ways that we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number one, through our hearts, the emotions that we feel, this is the first way that we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is what we call faith. Then number two, it is through our limbs. So the actions that we do, this is how we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these are the actions. And then the third way we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is through our tongues. And these, in summary, they are the crux of iman, that an individual cannot have iman up and until these three parts are worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with our hearts, with our beliefs, and then with our tongues, and then with our actions. Now, when you look at the basis of shirk, that what is an individual trying to achieve when they commit shirk? Obviously, an individual who commits shirk is ignorant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what he's trying to achieve is one of two things. One of two things that are exclusive to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The first is some sort of knowledge of the unseen. And then the second thing is that he's trying to attain some sort of benefit or avoid some sort of harm. So the first one is that he's trying to attain some sort of knowledge of the unseen. And then the second, he's trying to attain some sort of benefit or protection of some sort of harm. And you'll see that every act of shirk that takes place will encompass one of these two. Either he's trying to attain some sort of knowledge of the unseen, or number two, he's trying to attain some sort of benefit or avoid some sort of harm. So now, let's look at common day examples of how shirk takes place, but people don't recognize it. So one of the most common types of example where shirk actually takes place is an individual that reads the horoscope. So you'll notice that every day in your newspapers, regardless of what newspapers you read, actually, what's like a famous newspaper in Birmingham? What's a famous newspaper in Birmingham? 
the Birmingham Mail. So if you read something like the Birmingham Mail, you'll notice that usually at like the back or somewhere in the middle, they'll have like the horoscopes. So they divide the 12 months into you know, 12 different types of animals or zodiac signs rather. And depending the type of zodiac sign you have, they try to predict for you what type of your day is. Now, for those of you that may have read it accidentally or you know, read it in Jahiliya, you'll notice that it's absolute nonsense to begin with. It's like you've fallen in love with someone at some time in your life. And sometime this week, you'll have a good day. And sometime this week, you'll have a bad day. And it's such generic stuff. And the one who's like weak in Iman and weak in his head, he's like, oh my God, it's all coming true. You know, the Birmingham male knows my future and what's going to happen. And in actuality, it's all nonsense. But if you were to actually look at the severity of this action, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he tells us about the individual that goes to a fortune teller. And this individual that goes to a fortune teller has one of two scenarios. Either he believes the fortune teller, and then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says about this individual as is reported in Sahih Muslim, that he is disbelieved in what was revealed to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the individual that believes the fortune teller, he believes the horoscope that he's reading, then he's disbelieved in what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Meaning that this act has taken him outside the fold of Islam. The second uh, possible scenario is that an individual reads this horoscope or he goes to a fortune teller and he doesn't believe what he says, then for this individual, his salah will not be accepted for 40 days. Then this individual, his salah will not be accepted for 40 days. So it shows you that something that we take very lightly in our culture is that, hey, you know, you're skimming through the newspaper. You know, I happen to be, you know, I think one of, yeah, you happen to be like a cancer or zodiac sign. Then, you know, all of a sudden you read this and your salah could possibly be rendered null and void for 40 days. Or it could possibly be a means of you being, you know, thrown out of the religion of Islam. So it shows you the severity of it. Now, if you look at this, you know, what is an individual trying to achieve when he's trying to read his horoscope? Besides the fact that some people may find it entertaining, that's besides the point. But the individual that's trying to read his horoscope, he's trying to achieve that first level that we were talking about, trying to attain some knowledge. Now when you attribute knowledge of the unseen to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is a belief system that you know, is not allowed in Islam. That knowledge of the unseen is only exclusive to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let us take another example of common day shirk practices. Another example of common day shirk practices is oaths that people will take, or oaths that people will take. So you'll notice in the Quran, you'll see the following you know, segments. You'll see wallahi, you'll see, you'll see tallahi, you'll see billahi. And this is how the Quran actually teaches us to take an oath. That you know, from time to time, you will have to take an oath. Someone accuses you of something, and you will say, wallahi, I did not do that act. So this is like strengthening your argument that you're calling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to testify and you're you know, swearing by the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you did not do this act. Now this act of swearing by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is an actual act of ibadah, which is only exclusive to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why uh, Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu anhu, anhuma, he narrates from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, فَمَنْ كَانَ حَالِفًا فَلْيَحْلِحْ بِاللَّهِ that whoever is taking an oath, then let him take an oath by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you'll notice that in our day and age, from particularly those of us that come from the subcontinent, either from India, from Pakistan, from Bangladesh, from these cultures, I think maybe even like Somali cultures and stuff, they'll have this habit of, you know, I swear on my mother's head, or I swear on my mother's grave, or I'll swear upon, you know, any other relative or something else that we may consider of importance. But in Islam, this is something that is not allowed. It is an act of shirk. It is something which is impermissible. Now, even though this, this is an act of minor shirk, it does not mean that a person is allowed to do it. So this is a common day act of shirk that a person will do with their tongues. A person will do with their tongues. And with this type of act of shirk, a person is trying to attain the second type of you know, consequence that we had talked about. That he's trying to attain some sort of benefit or protect himself from some sort of harm. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one worthy of us taking an oath by. So if we were to ever take an oath or in a circumstance where we are required to take an oath, it should only be by saying wallahi, billahi, or tallahi. These are the three segments or the three ways that the sharia teaches us to take an oath in Islam. A third thing I would like to talk about that is a common practice. And that is the common practice of wearing amulets and talismans. Amulets and talismans. What is the difference between the two? An amulet is something that is man-made 
and it is something that they will wear around their body. So you perhaps you'll see someone wear something around their neck or wear it around their uh, wrists or wear it around their ankles or even wear it around their waists. And this is usually what we call a ta'wiz or a ta'wiz, you know, as is mentioned in Urdu. Now these types of ta'wiz are of two types. Those that have, you know, statements of the Qur'an and those that have, you know, authentic supplications from the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. On these types of uh, amulets, there's actually a valid difference of opinion. Is a Muslim allowed to wear them or is a Muslim not allowed to wear them? This ikhtilaf actually goes back to the time of, sah of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum ajma'een. So you have the camp of Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, ma, the, or radiallahu anhu that didn't allow wearing these talismans even if they had verses of the Qur'an or even if they had authentic supplications from the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said that the family of Ibn Mas'ud is above wearing such amulets because the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam never used to do so. And then the second camp it says that you know what, you actually are allowed wearing, are allowed wearing these talismans because one of the du'as that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to make was أعوذ بكلمات الله التامة من شر ما خلق That I seek refuge in the perfect and noble words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from all evil that is created. Now the perfect words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are none other than the Qur'an. So they derive from this that it was permissible to wear those amulets and talismans that had Qur'anic verses or authentic supplications from the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, the safer opinion seems to be that it is better to stay away from this. It is better to stay away from this. For the following three reasons, bithillahi ta'ala. Number one is that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam never did it himself, nor did he do it for any of his family members. He had young grandchildren, Hassan and Hussein, and even when he wanted to protect them, he would make dua for them and wouldn't, you know, wrap and tie things around them. Number two, is that you would expose these things to places that are improper. So an individual that's wearing something around his neck or wearing it around his wrist, he goes to the bathroom, right? And it's not appropriate to take verses of the Qur'an inside of the bathroom with you. So you'd expose it to, in, in that manner and fashion. And then the third thing is that inside this ta'weef, no one actually knows what's inside of it except for you, right? So someone else may see this and they may actually presume that you're doing something wrong. So to protect yourself from evil suspicion of others, something that we're encouraged to do, we would recommend not wearing those amulets or ta'wizes that have verses of the Qur'an or statements or authentic supplications of the Prophet ﷺ, even though there is a valid ikhtilaf over it. Then the second type of ta'wiz that you'll find are those ta'wiz that have absolute gibberish in it. And I'm sure you've seen those YouTube videos where you have, you know, those people that break these ta'wizes up and they have like these funny drawings and these funny numbers and scripts that you can't read. It may even have blood on it and different types of numerology and maybe even, you know, magic related to it. So all of these types of ta'wiz are completely outside of the fold of Islam. That this can take a person outside the fold of Islam because he's attributing something to this ta'wiz which is only exclusive to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is protection. That is protection. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one that is able to benefit and the only one that is able to harm. So to seek something or to seek protection or to seek benefit from other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can take a person outside the fold of Islam. So these are just three examples that I've mentioned tonight. Who remembers the three examples I've mentioned? What are the three examples of common day shirk that take place? Horoscopes, fantastic. Or going to a fortune teller. That's number one. What's number two? That's number three. Fantastic. So the amulets are number three. And what's number two? Taking an oath by other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these are common day examples of shirk. Now obviously this is a, a wide subject and array of you know, topics that needs to be discussed and studied. So what I would recommend for you, Bidinlahi Ta'ala, is that there's an excellent book. It's called Kitab al-Tawheed, or the Book of Tawheed, written by Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab. And in this book, he discusses the act of shirk in detail. And just to give you an idea of you know, one of the reasons why this book was written, that in our day and age, no one actually talks about shirk. Right? It is something that is ignored. People say, you know, Aqidah is a useless subject. It is a futile subject. It doesn't need to be studied. But Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab, rahimahullah ta'ala, he brings forth a very valuable and powerful point. And that point was that imagine someone told you that they slept with their mother. You know, a'udhu billah, they slept with their mother. What would the reaction of us be? 
Now, how would we react to that? It would be considered a repugnant act. We would find it disgusting and you know, despicable and something that we would all stay away from. But then you tell someone that you have someone who sacrificed a chicken to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And some of us might even laugh at that. You know, we'd consider it a joke. It would be something completely insignificant. But now when you look at these two acts in the sight of the Sharia and weigh them on the scales of good and evil, you'll notice that as evil and as repugnant as it is for an individual to sleep with their mother, even more despicable in the eyes of the Sharia is for other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be worshipped. And this is why Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, when he asked the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa what is the most evil of deeds, he said, أَن تَجْعَلَ لِلَّهِ نِدًّا وَهُوَ الَّذِي خَلَقَكَ That it is to create a rival and a partner with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while recognizing He is the one that created you. So any act that takes an individual away from the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is considered one of the most repugnant acts. Now I want to conclude with one last point with Allah ta'ala before Shaykh Ahsan addresses you about the topic of Tawheed. And that is the act of magnifying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inside of our hearts. You notice in the month of Ramadan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He gave us three objectives for Ramadan. And people usually confuse the objectives of Ramadan with the objectives of fasting. So the objective of fasting, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells us, كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ السِّيَامِ كَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ That fasting was prescribed for you just like it was prescribed before you in hopes that you may attain taqwa. So the objective behind fasting is to attain taqwa. That is why we fast. Now, what is the actual objective of Ramadan? What is the actual objective of Ramadan? In the very, or subsequent verses, next two or three verses after this, around 185 in Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He starts off the verse by saying, Shahrul Ramadan, that the month of Ramadan. And then He concludes the verse by saying, وَلِتُكْمِلُوا الْعِدَّةَ وَلِتُكَبِّرُوا اللَّهَ عَلَى مَا هَدَاكُمْ وَلَعَلَّكُمْ تَشْكُرُونَ so the objectives of Ramadan are actually threefold. So that you may complete this training period known as Ramadan. That we fast this one month of Ramadan, striving our utmost best to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the training period that will prepare us throughout the rest of the year. Then the third objective that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions is that you may be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we're meant to be grateful for all of the blessings, the good health, the food, the family, the company, the ability to worship Allah, the ability to join our brothers and sisters in congregation. We're all thankful for these things. Then the middle objective that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions is, وَلِتُكَبِّرَ Allah. Now generally, we, when we hear the word, word takbir, we generally hear of like, we think of like a fundraiser or someone's out on the battlefield and they're like takbir and everyone shouts Allahu Akbar. Now just one segment of it, you know, saying Allahu Akbar is just one segment of making takbir of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I want to explain this in, you know, just a little bit of detail. I want you to reflect on your salah. When you start off your salah, each and every one of us starts off by saying Allahu Akbar. We don't start off by saying subhanallah, we don't start off by saying alhamdulillah, we don't start off by saying la ilaha illallah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala specifically chose the statement Allahu Akbar. Now what does this statement Allahu Akbar actually signify? It signifies the fact that when you start your salah, there is nothing greater, there's nothing more important in your life than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that your tongue is reaffirming what is already in your heart. Now the objective of Ramadan is to constantly show that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is greater and more important than all of our desires. And that is why we give up our food, we give up our drink, we give up our desires in the sake and hopes of attaining the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now this has a direct link in its relationship with Tawheed and committing shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You'll notice that an individual that does not fulfill his heart with the magnification of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, can very easily fall into shirk. Because he doesn't realize the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He hasn't placed the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why I would recommend that, you know, from the objectives of Ramadan is to make the takbir of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not just with our tongues, but with our hearts as well. And this is the very basis of tawheed. So in this month of Ramadan, make this your objective. To make Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the object of your love, the object of your concern, the object of your magnification. So each and every moment of your life is meant to reflect this, is meant to reflect this. 
And this is the essence of Tawheed that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala becomes your ultimate goal. You're living and you're dying, you're breathing, you're sleeping, you're eating, your worship, your rituals, all of it are meant to be for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now I'll conclude with one last point. I'll conclude with one last point. And that is a story that's actually very, very personal to me. Perhaps, you know, we can all derive a lesson from it. Um, my father was born, and my grandfather was born and raised in Pakistan. In fact, as far as I know, the only time he ever left Pakistan was when he went for Hajj and Umrah. And after that, he's never left, you know, Pakistan besides that. So just those two times. And growing up in Pakistan, obviously there was this culture of, you know, going to the mazar, going to the graves, and going to the peers, and going to, you know, all of these things which weren't good. And there was such a culture in the house that everyone was so afraid of him, that even if to, to speak out against him, it was very, very difficult. And even though he did these things of going to the mazars, and people knew it was wrong amongst our family, no one ever said anything to him because they were afraid of him. Now, when he passed away, he passed away all of a sudden. You know, it wasn't like he had a prolonged sickness and they knew he was going to pass away, but rather he passed away all of a sudden. And this actually became a very pivotal point in our family. In the sense that when he passed away, people knew that he was going to the graves. People knew that he was committing shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And after you learned the dangers of shirk today, that one of the dangers was that you can't seek forgiveness for those people that die upon shirk. And when that moment came instantaneously, it was no longer possible to give my grandfather da'wah. It was no longer possible you know, to, to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide him. It was no longer possible to even like, debate and you know, argue some of the, the, the points of discussion that he had. That opportunity came to an end. And obviously the ultimate consequences is, the consequence is that we do not know, you know his final fate in, in, the, in, in the hereafter. It is feared that he might be in the hellfire and there's nothing that we can do about it. So in this life, it's about taking advantage of, you know, those moments that you have. You have someone committing shirk in your family, take advantage of giving da'wah to them and guiding to them to what is correct, bithnillahi ta'ala. Because if that death comes instantaneously, you can no longer seek forgiveness for them. And that opportunity to save them from the hellfire is gone. So I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protects us from the hellfire and He protects our families from the hellfire. Jazakum Allah khairan for your attention. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Ashadu la ilaha illa. أستغفرك وأتوب إليك والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم